Good afternoon or morning or evening uh, to everyone. We are uh, widespread uh, over the globe today. It's an unusual situation. I'm personally talking from home. I made an effort to put a EGU logo in my background. I'm not sure you see it in uh, the right way, but uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, this is a new experience for all of us. And uh, uh, I think it will be a nice uh, and a very useful experience. So I would like to thank you attendees. I'm very glad to see so many of you today. I would like to thank the speakers who accepted to talk in a very unusual situation. And uh, I am very, very grateful to sister associations. I think it is very significant that uh, AGI, AGU, AOGS, GSA, and the JPGU and the GSL are co-sponsoring this session. This is a clear demonstration of the key importance of scientific integrity for modern science. Um, let me point out, in fact, that this session was planned and the speakers were, were invited well before COVID-19 in a world we know that was very different and probably will never go back to its uh, previous configuration. However, by an irony of fate, I think that the role of scientific integrity during this period, during the current global emergency is more important than ever. And therefore I think this session indeed is very timely. In fact, we slightly changed the title because we think that it's very important to have a discussion on scientific integrity today. Indeed, uh, we all know, we are experts, we are geoscientists, planetary and space scientists. We are experts on uh, global uh, crisis uh, and management of catastrophes. And we know that during this kind of crisis, integrity, and in particular scientific integrity, are, is a fundamental value to ensure a quick recovery. And we can see it today. We can see that the development of the pandemic clearly show the importance of science. The support of scientists turns out to be fundamental to take decisions and devise strategies. And uh, I think above all, scientists are essential to establish a proper communication and cooperation with the public, which are essential ingredients to recovery. And we are seeing in these days the key importance of the public trust in science which is, uh, uh, in turn, uh, it is stimulated by the trust of uh, policy makers uh, in people. And uh, these are all based on scientific integrity, which is essential to make sure that we trust each other. So I, I think that indeed, uh, today we are discussing of issues that are also very relevant to COVID-19. And uh, I think we may get today important guidance on how to transform this crisis into an opportunity. It looks like a slogan, but actually I think that uh, getting opportunities from this situation is the best way to honor the memory of the friends and colleagues who lost uh, their lives uh, together with uh, the so many people, uh, other people during the past uh, few weeks. Also, I think that uh, in this period, uh, geosciences uh, have an important role to play. Actually, I, I have been approached by several journalists and people in the past few weeks, uh, asked me my opinion on how geosciences can contribute to recovery from, uh, recovering from the pandemics. And uh, I mean, it is a challenging question, but after thinking at it, uh, I, I found that the answer is uh, relatively easy and is based uh, on uh, an essential premise. I think that uh, while uh, we recover from the pandemics, uh, we have to make sure that we don't expose, we don't increase our exposure and vulnerability with respect to other global threats. In other words, uh, I think that while uh, devising strategies and actions to recovery from the pandemics, uh, we can uh, make sure that this action in a synergic way helps the humanity to reduce its global exposure to crises like the pandemics. 
And uh, in order to be so synergic, in order to devise effective strategies for protecting the humanity by all these kind of events, uh, I think we need the support of all science, all the scientific disciplines. We need the support of geosciences as well as, uh, as, well as planetary and space sciences. So I think that this can work if we are aware of the relevant role of scientific integrity and the relevant role of keeping an open and transparent approach to science. And this is what we, we are discussing today. It's now time to introduce uh, the first speaker, who is uh, Chris McEntee. The other speakers will be introduced later by the other co-conveners before they talk. So, Chris, uh, first of all, Chris, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. For over 25 years, Chris has successfully led societies to increase their impact and reach through reinvention and innovation in governance, membership, publishing, meetings, public policy, and outreach. So her experience on scientific integrity is an exceptional one. Most recently, as we know, she served as the CEO of the American Geophysical Union, our excellent sister association that annually serves more than 100,000 members. Again, it's another sign of uh, excellent experience in science and scientific integrity. Chris uh, has received numerous awards uh, for her outstanding leadership, including the Professional CEO of the Year. It's a recognition that is awarded by CEO Update. She also received the 40 Under 40 Movers and Shaker Award by Crane uh, Chicago Business. And also she's a recipient of the ASAE's uh, Women Who Advance America Award. Chris, uh, we are really looking forward to your presentation today and uh, I'm already thanking you very much already now for, for joining. Please, Chris. Thank you, Alberto, very much for the opportunity to be with you all today. The title of my presentation is Earth and Space Science in the 21st Century, A Call to Action. And I wanna cover three key points. One is to um, reinforce through a few examples uh, the role that Earth and Space Science has as the essential science for the 21st century. How I see the COVID-19 crisis presenting an opportunity uh, for scientists and scientific integrity to really uh, position Earth and space science is even more relevant than perhaps appreciated in the past and suggests that we rethink science as a boundary channel and the role as an advocate in terms of positioning Earth and space science as essential and seize upon this opportunity. I think we all know we only have one habitable planet and that the human impact on this planet is very significant. And all of these issues related to the ability of the planet to continue to support habitats are grounded in the domains of Earth and space science. Uh, all sustainability issues, the growing population, the food supply, making sure we have clean air, soil, and water, uh, climate change, the stress on natural resources, moving through the energy transition. And of course, these relate to human interactions with our planet, but we know the planet itself has a number of natural hazards, weather, climate conditions that also threaten public safety, health, well being, and economic prosperity. The work done by the Stockholm Resilience Center is a good example of the impact of the stressors that are being placed on this planet, where they found that already the planet has exceeded what they view as safe planetary boundaries for biodiversity loss the nitrogen circle cycle and the climate crisis with several others pushing on the limits of planetary boundaries to make things safe for habitats to continue in a symbiotic way on this planet because of this the un has developed the sustainable development goals and I could argue that Earth and space science has an essential role to play in all 17 of these goals, 
but at the same time, at least over half of them are squarely in the domain of the contributions of earth and space science uh, to prosperity in society and to maintaining biodiversity and a resilient and sustainable ecosystem over time. Now, earth and space science, if it is the science of this century, because of the grand societal challenges being faced to maintain this planet as the way we want to see it maintained in the future, but it doesn't exist or sit in a bubble. Many factors influence the intersection of science and society and the role that earth and space scientists can provide. Some of these are square, squarely within the domain of, sci of science. It's long been talked about academic silos, research silos, and the rewards and incentives in science uh, favor those doing the fundamental research and high impact research and are not as favorable for those who want to engage in the work of science and society, crossing disciplines within and outside of earth and space science, be science communicators, or work in roles outside of traditional academic disciplines. At the same time, we also know that external factors such as how well is science trusted, are science and scientists acting with integrity, are also really critical in terms of, of societal value and relevance and intersection with society. And there's been a growing push to globalization being countered by the fact of nationalism and populism, which also prevents sometimes countervailing forces in being able to achieve both global uh, collaboration in science that continues to accelerate, but also global governance to be able to address these key societal challenges that are global in nature and not uh, bound by uh, geographic uh, divisions in terms of states and countries and regions. And finally, the fourth industrial re revolution, which is leading to the internet of things and big data everywhere is impacting all sectors of society and how we interact, how we work, how we live, we play, and also how research is conducted. Now to me, COVID-19, because I'm known to be a glass half full person, as scary as it is, and being in the age group where I'm at a higher risk, it also makes it especially scary. I always see an opportunity um, in every crisis. And if we look through two past recent histories, uh, Winston Churchill saw the opportunity and the difficulty of World War II, and Rahm Emanuel, who served in the uh, Obama White House at the right at the height of the beginning of the 2008 financial crisis saw it as an opportunity to never let a good crisis go to waste. So why is COVID-19, as Alberta was saying, an opportune time for earth and space science to also be even more relevant and valuable to society and intersect more for society to solutions and in the future? Well, even before COVID-19, the Welcome Global Monitor Trust that looks as uh, respect and trust in scientists around the world saw that in every region around the world, uh, a majority of those who responded, and this is statistically significant in terms of the representative of the global population by regions, either placed high trust or medium trust in science. So we already had a base to build upon. And in less than half a year, because of science, even in the United States, where we have an administration that does not value science as we would like, but in less than a half a year, because of science, institutions and society have rethought the entire educational experience, rethought the conference experience like we're doing today. Research institutions and universities are adjusting their tenure and promotion practices to allow more flexibility uh, given the disruption. There's been accelerated global scientific collaboration to find a cure and treatments for this disease despite political barriers. Society has responded in an unprecedented way about social distancing and quarantines, and everyone is beginning to plan new ways of living, working, educating, and researching for things to be different when this crisis ends. So I think this gives us an opportunity to update mental models of how science is done. Vandeveer Bush, in his Endless Frontier, um, in the mid-20th uh, century, proposed what he called the linear model of science. And this is the thing that is still fairly understood and thought about today. 
that is that governments provide the research funding, it goes to academia, and then there's this middle ground of consultants and translators who then work with the policy and business sectors to develop applications and get to societal benefits. In 1997, though, Stokes updated this to say, let's talk about what he called past year's quadrant. Quadrant, and this was based and named after Louis Pasteur, who framed used inspired science and said that you can both be looking for societal applications, in his case, to uh, deal with a disease in uh, the bovine population and in for binters, but you also can advance germ theory at the same time, the fundamental understanding of germ theory. Recently, the National Science Foundation has talked about convergence research, the merging of ideas, approaches, and technologies from widely diverse fields of knowledge to stimulate innovation and discovery. This is an important step for the National Science Foundation to talk about funding transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary research. It is still grounded in scientific institutions and scientific research without much discussion of also engaging the policy sector, the civic sector, and the corporate and financial sector as co-collaborators on the research. In 2008, Ben Schneiderman and PNNS talked about the twin-win model of research goals, where he talked about combining institutional university researchers with the corporate sector to both come up with breakthrough theories and published papers and validated solutions that would be ready for widespread dissemination. And he actually looked at the citation uh, impact when universities in the US actually partnered with the corporate sector. He found that when the universities, top six private universities, actually co collaborated with the corporate sector, actually their number of citations went up, also in international collaboration. He found the same result with the top six US public universities in the United States. So I want to call today for a discussion on what I'm calling beyond convergence. And this is adding to our toolbox a role not for translators out of science, but science scientists, research institutions as boundary spanners, where we could foster civic and policy debate that's well grounded in relevant science and to encourage science that can serve communities, places, environments, and sustainability. And when we think about creating this discipline within science or in collaboration, but not as a distinct discipline that somewhere is in between science and other sectors of the economy. Here we'll be working in a co-design and co-production of knowledge role. And a couple of ways we could do this is we could institute co-design stakeholder research and application collaborate collaboratives, which adopt the twin-win model. We could build bridges within and outside of science. For example, the, C -City, the C40 cities program is the mayors of the large uh, cities around the world who have all set goals to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their cities by really aggressive targets. However, if you look at the work they're doing and their website, you don't see partners listed from scientific societies and research institutions. Vice versa, Future Earth is taking on similar challenges, but if you look at their advisory board, you will be hard to find somebody outside of a scientific background who is serving on their advisory board and advising on the work that they're doing. I also want to call for scientists to get more comfortable engaging in advocacy and to add recognition rewards and incentives for those who are willing to be boundary spanders and to be advocates. And I just want to talk a little bit for on this one slide about scientific credibility and advocacy. It is thought that engagement in advocacy hurts the credibility of scientists. However, in the US, a randomized national survey was done to actually test this with scientists talking about climate change. And you can see that the credibility of science was actually very consistent until the scientists actually said they were for nuclear power. But even there, it did not drop in a very significant manner. And as Nancy Pelosi recently said in the COVID crisis, when she was asking about scientists being political, she said, I don't want to be political about COVID either, but it is political. And so make no mistake, the decision not to speak is also a political decision. So my three, back to my three key points for today, that we can rethink um, science as a boundary channel as an advocate because our science is so essential 
and that COVID creates an opportunity for learn to that and reposition um, Earth and space science as even more relevant into the future. And Ralph Waldo Emerson in the 1873 was talking for scientists to do the same, and he said, action is essential without it. Thought can never ripen into truth. Thank you for the opportunity to present my thoughts. Alrighty, well, thank you very much, Chris, as usual. You're so stimulating to hear you speak. And I wanna thank Alberto and Chloe for pulling this off. It's really wonderful to see everybody's faces. I think this is one of the rem other remarkable things that the pandemic has done is it's really connected us. It's invited us, whether we want it or not, into each other's homes. It's, and at the same time, I've been in homes of people I never thought I'd go into their homes of. Um, it's highlighted the importance of science. You know, we, we see everybody's looking at graphs. And it's also really made it clear that we as humans can work together to solve a really gnarly problem. Um, AGU has just finished its new strategic plan and we've really laid out the vision of a thriving, sustainable and equitable future, which is really what we're talking about here is how we can be, make sure that our future is supported by discovery, innovation and action. But underpinning that has to be the values of excellence, integrity, respect, diversity, coll collaboration, and bringing forward the next generation of scientists and a, and a scientifically engaged public. So I like to think we're, there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the pandemic and as we recover it. As earth scientists, we're used to working in this interconnected both scientific world and our interconnected physical processes and human processes, remembering we're part of them. So as we recover from this public health crisis, we, I think we have a very unique opportunity to move forward on what we've seen as the planetary health crisis. Our science will continue to be essential and we must work to build those global connections as we speak from our homes and as we learn how to work together even new different ways. So with that overview of where AGU is going and of where we as societies are, it is my pleasure to introduce Claudia Jesus Rayner, who's a geotechnical engineer and served as a consultant both in Denmark and Sweden for several years before moving in 2009 to Brussels, where she joined the European Research Council as program officer in charge of earth and space science research. At ERC, she's also the coordinator of the Gender Activity Group, back to that diversity issue, which is so keen to key to the future of our science. Um, and she's a, in 2018, she was nominated the chair of EGU's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Working Group. So with that, we turn it over to Claudia and are looking forward to her, what she has to tell us today and what we can learn. And thank you so much. Thank you very much for this introduction. Science is rooted in basic values and rights, and freedom is one of them. Freedom ranging from uh, the freedom of thought, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, and to report findings. Indeed, the relationship between intellectuals or scientists and the rulers has drawn attention in many different historical contexts. Scientists did not have an easy life. And history is rich in examples of struggles by scientists for freedom. They often had to struggle to find patterns and to avoid prosecution and not always succeeding, but also fighting religious authorities, often associated with political power was a permanent challenge to freedom of thought and freedom of movement, which is a major requirement for scientific cooperation and dissemination. Nowadays, we also have other important players. We have industry on one hand, which represents a very powerful sector 
by supporting some people and challenging and sometimes even discrediting the finding of others. These mostly driven by economical strategies and market shares. And then there's also the media, sometimes taking a complacent, partial role, driven by audiences and populistic approaches, instead of reporting facts and committed to the role of potential mass educators. We live certainly in worrying times. We are dealing with the climate crisis, the climate crisis in times where some politicians are tempted to deglobalize economies and trade by closing borders and even building walls once again. Letting scientific collaboration be affected but, and reshaped by some of these visions is highly concerning, especially when we know that the challenge that we are facing are global. Nationalism conditions the impact that research and science can have. And now, on top of all of this uh, mix, we have a pandemic affecting the world with unprecedented conditions and impacts that are difficult to fully predict. The importance of global collaboration and scientific findings has never been so acute and also so visible to the public which actually brings in some very unexpected twists. For instance, after decades of propaganda against vac vaccines by some groups, we have now literally the whole world anxiously hoping for a vaccine. Now, this represents a unique opportunity for science in the future, but this also requires responsible actions and high standards of integrity in order to resist the pressures and temptations of promising the impossible. Just this morning, The Guardian reported the news from the UK, stating that the public trust in science risks being damaged by potential political interferences that continually say, hey, we are following the science advice all the way, because in fact the public domain don't know what the scientists are advising and because the advisors are not fully free to come on radio and television and tell what their advisors has been to tackle complex global problems it is necessary freedom of movement to cooperate scientifically using collective capacity that is available but also the freedom to share and access data and freedom to disseminate results and ideas, even when those ideas and results are not popular. And this can only be fully delivered in a setting that is unbiased by conflicting interests, be those economical, political, and sometimes even personal. And this is why high risk research is successful mainly through public funding and funding that from not for profit institutions universities and research bodies where actually the necessary conditions are in place for creative minds to develop their ideas freely our experience at the erc actually shows that scientific research functions as a rather complex ecosystem and to thrive no component can be neglected and by the way funding is only one of them one of the most important components is trust is the trust for instance in the integrity of the evaluation system which in our case has resulted in a worldwide recognition of our results of our and our grantees but there's also a reciprocal trust in the integrity of the scientists that are given full freedom to carry out research with no predefined priority topics and whilst the erc is a fully bottom-up the research carried out by grantees actually addresses a wide range of issues in the outbreak of the pandemic we could 
quickly identify over 50 ERC projects equivalent to 100 million euros that were contributing to the response to the COVID-19 pandemic by providing insights from several different scientific fields, ranging from virology, epidemiology, immunology, paths for new diagnostics and treatments, public health, medical devices, artificial intelligence, social behavior, crisis management, and mathematical modeling of the pandemic's evolution based on physical systems. Being responsible at the ERC for the Earth System Sciences Research Area, I've been seeing daily the impacts of the pandemic in scientific activities of researchers. And we're still in the early stages of this pandemic. Research in the geosciences in an age of pandemics is significantly impacted. During lockdown and travel bans, there are no possibilities for to carry fieldwork or carry out expeditions, to access labs for experiments and analysis. This will, without doubt, result in significant delay in scientific production, and several will have implications in track records of some scientists. And from my observation, I can see already now that some fields and some groups of people are much more affected than others, even within the geosciences. And then there are the networking opportunities, such as EGU, GPGU, and AGU, which are so important to open horizons and create new opportunities for collaborations especially for the early career scientists. And this is not so easy to fully recreate in a virtual setting. Now, best practices to tackle the effects of a pandemic require out-of-the-box thinking and actions, but also flexibility and solidarity. In reaction to the COVID-19 crisis, the ERC immediately reminded grantees of the existing possibility to adjust their research program to address, to address COVID-19 related research in their ongoing projects. In addition to this, and also similar to other funding bodies, we are offering grant extensions quasi-automatic to projects directly or indirectly affected. Okay, this is about institutions, but let us not forget that scientists themselves as individuals are part of a system that actually makes decisions about people. There is the peer review system making decisions on who, when and what gets to be published. Another example in the hands of the scientific communities is recruitment promotion, mentoring, nominations, awards. Remember that this power is also a remarkable opportunity for scientists to stand above political flows and do what is right and needed in an era of global challenges. And this in time where the power, in my opinion, ought to be guided by a higher sense of fairness and integrity to tackle the risk of further increasing the inequalities in both our society, but also within our own scientific communities. Now, to conclude, note that to remain loyal to principles of integrity, it's the only way for scientists to safeguard freedom for their own sake, but also for the society at large. And in fact, not having a clear position in controversial topics is a position and a rather damaging one. More than ever, we all need to stand up collectively, but also individually in order to preserve our common values and rights. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. I think uh, it's now the turn uh, of uh... Odaka to introduce. Uh, oh, yes. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. I'm Hodaka Kawahata from Japan Geosciences Unions. First of all, the we JPGU completely agree and endorse uh, the declaration of significance of geoscience expertise uh, led by the EGU president, uh, Professor Alberto Montanari. And we would like to promote the recognized items in the future. And it's a pity that we could not meet uh, many scientists at the EG meeting due to COVID-19. One kind of the severe hazards. But since we had no flights to Vienna, we may contribute to the carbon offset this time, maybe. And people recognize the effect by the virtual world at the moment, according to the latest the economic forecast, the air traffic demand will not return for the time being, even after the COVID-19 due to less travel in several years. Geoscience community considers the advantage, disadvantage of holding the venues or the virtual meeting, that is, what we can do without meeting directly and what we cannot do without meeting. By taking the advantage of this experience, we want to develop more attractive meeting in future. Our second JPGU AG meeting has been postponed for seven weeks, and now that we work hard to make an attractive packages. Next year, the corona pandemic will be over. Then we hope to hold the special sessions to discuss on the overcome the COVID-19 and the future development of the us and the planetary science by inviting the old president by, from the unions. Anyway, I would like to introduce the next speakers. Dr. Silvia Peperoni. Silvia is a geologist working at Italian Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. She's interested in the geohazards, georisks, and the geoscience communications. She's also the international leader of geoethics. She has been awarded in Italy for science, communications, and natural literature. Today, she will make uh, an interesting presentation on the geoscientists as a social and political actors. Please. Good afternoon, and thanks for inviting me to this event. I would like to share some personal thoughts, starting from the two key words of this symposium, integrity and freedom. In the past days, I wondered if integrity is even possible without freedom, or if freedom is possible without integrity. In a moral sense, integrity refers to being incorrupt, honest, strictly adherent to ethical principles. And this adherence is not simply formal, but implies a conscious and convinced observance of a set of rules when conducting activities. Freedom is exemption from external control, interference and regulation. In philosophical terms, freedom is the power to exercise choice and to make decisions without constraints or threats. Freedom means independence of thought, an indispensable prerequisite for new discoveries and advancement. So I believe that in science, only the simultaneous presence of both those conditions can ensure to a scientist the possibility of producing a science of the highest quality. Excellent science requires freedom to follow up and shape intuitions, but at the same time requires absolute adherence to research integrity principles and scientific methods. The present pandemic has shown the need for integrity and freedom as fundamental elements for practicing a science that is truly in the service of human beings. Especially in times of crisis, it is necessary to ensure the maximum response of the system to a threat. And if the threat is new, unknown, like the COVID-19, scientists must be left free to apply their knowledge, to follow their intuitions, to explore all possible solutions, and also to have a clash of opinions if needed that are functional to scientific progress. 
in times of health emergency, each citizen requires reliable answers from those who know the issue from a scientific point of view and from those who consequently have to make decisions on behalf of the community. So competence, professional updating, cooperation, fair comparison between different hypotheses and openness to dialogue are the basis of scientifically rooted and carefully weighted political decisions through the expert advice of scientists. Now let's see the words that introduce the symposium. Society benefits from scientific research and communication of results. It is evident to everyone how true this sentence is right now in the midst of the pandemic. In Italy, as in other countries, scientists are supporting governments in making decisions. Their interventions has contributed decisively to influence the political strategies in addressing the emergency. Well, the same should also apply to geoscientists. As geoscientists, we are at the forefront of informing and supporting society in the face global anthropogenic changes. And this implies ethical and social obligations. It is evident that the geoscientists are involved in politics in particular when we deal with issues that have to do with people's life or that have repercussions in economic and environmental terms. Geoscientists consciously or unconsciously contribute to building the social identity of human communities, to defining a cultural and perceptive vision of the world and society. When we devote ourselves to training and education in geoscience, we are doing politics. Through our knowledge, we are playing an active role in the political and social life of our nations. We are putting ourselves at the service of the common good. We are contributing to the construction of a knowledgeable society. And knowledge is a fundamental value on which to build a more aware, just, inclusive and democratic society. So it is fundamental to find the best way to propose geoscience knowledge to politics, highlighting the contribution that we can give to society in supporting the choices of governments on the best strategies to follow, but without hiding in any circumstance the uncertainty that accompanies our scenarios, the errors of our models, always refusing to say what we don't know. We have to be transparent in communicating scientific information, taking care that the final users of that information are capable of understanding it. So the problem is not only what to say, but also how to say it. Usually politicians, as well as citizens, are not prepared to understand concepts such as probability, uncertainty, or error that are fundamental in geoscience, especially when we talk about risks. So they often demand us to provide infallible forecasts, while only probabilistic ones are possible. This is the reason why it is important that the scientific information is accompanied by clear explanations in order to put the society in the condition to understand also the limits of our scenarios. At the same time, the communication of a partial truth should be avoided because it may create misunderstandings and open the door to conspiracy thinking in the population. And finally, we must not claim the monopoly of truth because there are many other factors, not only scientific, but also social or economic ones that may influence a political decision. So in my opinion, this is what the current pandemic is teaching geoscientists. So we must devote ourselves to establish a fruitful relationship with governments based on a specific skills relating to the problems to be addressed, on the availability of verified and verifiable data, 
on a respectful attention to different scientific hypotheses and intervention methods, on a clear definition of the achievable objectives, and also multidisciplinary interaction skills and availability to cooperate. Another point of this symposium, research may be threatened by censorship, intimidation, or political interference. Three critical situations that can seriously compromise the work of each geoscientist, threaten their scientific freedom, and undermine the possibility of conducting a qualified scientific activity. Furthermore, freedom is also the guarantee for acting ethically. Free geoscientists are in the position to propose their, the choices they deem right in a certain circumstance. In the presence of political pressures or threat, the way to proceed in research is altered. The geoscientist can lose the control of the scientific process. Fear, instinct for survival, the compromise to avoid additional negative consequences will take over. Ultimately, geoscientists will not do the best for society, but their work will only be functional to please those who are intimidating them. In these cases, only legal frameworks based on fundamental human rights can help those who are persecuted. But our scientific community can do much, especially to help those colleagues who are living in very difficult contexts those geoscientists who are not protected by liberal legal systems, the existence of authoritative organizations such as the EGU, the AGU, IUGS, and many others can make a difference. They can intervene by putting pressure on governments so that they, in turn, act as promoters of actions according to traditional international channels. A motivated, cohesive, and responsible international geoscience community can assure a safe operating space to geoscientists, also to those who work in difficult or even oppressive conditions, for whom carrying out honestly their profession can also mean losing one's job or even jeopardizing one's life. A safe space to support them to follow best practices and ethical principles, to qualify their work and recognize the value of a responsible action to counter abuses and intimidation. We, who work in a safe and relatively free context, we owe these to them. So there is a need for shared governance between those geoscience organizations, the creation of a large network articulated in different forms and instruments. For example, joint commissions that are able to dialogue with governments or observatories that somehow monitor the most critical situations worldwide. We should create more transparent, authoritative and independent international governance mechanisms in the geoscience field which encourage the circulation of knowledge and experience among the nations and provide decision-making support to governments. These bodies should facilitate the integration of decisions by each country that impact a globalized human system, rather than the initiatives that refers only to local contexts. So let's learn from the current pandemic the importance to create a global geoscience governance, really capable of dealing with possible future planetary crises. Because the decisions, even the drastic ones, that humanity will necessarily have to take in those situations will have to be shared and carefully weighted in advance. And this absolutely needs the clear definition of the last three key words of the symposium, policies, roles, and responsibilities. Defining our roles and responsibility is a priority task to avoid the misunderstandings and undue overlaps with other stakeholders. Everyone should ask themselves as a preliminary act that defines their scientific and ethical status what is my role as a geoscientist in society? And what are the social responsibilities that result 
from holding that specific position in the social architecture. The geoscientist has a social role, is a, a social actor. Policies are nothing more than the formalization of the interactions of various social stakeholders, including geoscientists and politicians. But their definition presupposes that the social value of our acting is already clear within ourselves. It is precisely in relation to the social context that the geoscientist assumes at the same time the dual role of moral subject and social actor. A moral subject, therefore, an agent consciously responsible for their own conduct and actions. A social subject who actively contributes to the construction of the idea of society, to the vision of its future, to its cultural and economic development based on the democratic value of shared responsibility. As geoscientists, we are knowledge builders, custodians and educators of knowledge. We are developers, managers and controllers of scientific methods and processes. We should be open to novelty, but also doubtful, rigorous, but also intuitive. Curiosity should push our intellect, critical thinking and scientific rigor should connote our action. We are able to provide data, develop scenarios, outline options, and suggest possible solutions by always taking into account the limits of our knowledge and models, and always keeping in mind that operational decisions have to be left to decision makers. They are the ones who have to choose between the different options. Our great responsibility towards politics and society consists of being competent, expert, and honest advisor, while our worst fault lies in becoming an instrument of political consensus and power. Thank you for your attention. Okay, and uh, I think it is now uh, the co-convener, Douglas Walker, who is introducing uh, the next speaker. Hi, I'm Doug Walker. I'm uh, from the Geological Society of America and the University of Kansas. Uh, this has been a fantastic session so far. It's interesting to hear these talks and to, to hear the other perspectives with the fact that GSA has gone through, um, uh, uh, just completed a planning and starting to implement a strategic plan to move forward. Of course, at the base of this is scientific integrity and honesty, but we're also working towards other goals. Uh, obviously, the public policy aspect is something that we have to keep going, but also the unique challenges for a geological society on inclusivity and to bring everybody into uh, working, especially in the field sciences, trying to make those opportunities. And I think this crisis um, will emphasize to us even being more inclusive and being able to develop better and more unique ways of, of communicating our scientific knowledge, our scientific results, so that we can really participate in shaping the future of policy and shaping the future of other people's opinions through integrity and honesty in science. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jorge Hueta Perez. He is the Senior Vice President of the University of Central America, UCA Nicaragua, where he also runs a molecular biology lab. He received his PhD in biological sciences and biogeochemistry, biochemistry from the University of Sao Paulo School of Medicine, Brazil. In 2009, Jorge became the founding president of the Academy of Sciences of Nicaragua. Jorge has been a consultant to numerous governmental and non-governmental organizations, including United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, <clears throat> German Agency for International Cooperation. Jorge is an outspoken advocate for improving science education and the appropriate use of biotechnology for sustainable development. Jorge. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, 
you may have heard a lot about Nicaragua in the past two years, especially, although uh, with the recent COVID experiences, uh, you know, the news about Nicaragua has not been uh, necessarily on the headlines. However, uh, there's a very difficult situation that we have been facing in the past couple of years. And I want to tell you about how does that situation has been impacting uh, the education and scientific uh, sectors. So, uh, you know about uh, Nicaragua, uh, which is a country that has been historically affected by natural uh, disasters, including uh, earthquakes. You may be familiar with the 1972 uh, earthquake in the capital city of Managua that left uh, more than 10,000 deaths and completely destroyed the whole capital city. So the current capital city that we have now is uh, absolutely uh, a new city compared to the one that we had in 1972. And so we also had other natural disasters uh, such as the Mitch hurricane, which was a uh, very uh, horrible disa uh, disaster that occurred in 1998 in the whole Central America, but in particular in Honduras and Nicaragua, where it affected uh, and created a bunch of landslides uh, with more than 2,000 deaths. Uh, and so on, we have had many fires, you know, and more recently, uh, a fire in the natural reserves in the Indio Maiz two years ago. And also just this year, a couple of weeks ago, we also had been experiencing a lot of uh, devastating uh, fires uh, in the north part of Nicaragua. And usually these natural disasters are intertwined with uh, repeated political crises, uh, including foreign uh, interventions, dictatorships, you know, the Cold War, Nicaragua experienced 10 years of war in the 80s. Uh, armed conflicts and also uh, many political unrests. And obviously, you know, this conjunction of natural disasters and political crises have uh, been hampering the economy of Nicaragua and also devastating uh, institutions, including those institutions that care uh, regarding the vulnerabilities, geographic vulnerabilities in Nicaragua. And uh, all of this has been more recently aggravated uh, by the effects of uh, global warming. And Nicaragua is one of the most affected countries uh, in the world. So against this uh, difficult background, uh, scientists, and in particular, uh, scientists in the geosciences have been making significant strides, both in education and uh, in research. So uh, the scientific community of geoscientists have been building a more resilient Nicaragua by doing many uh, activities, including creating networks for operating seismic, volcanic, meteorological, hydrological uh, activities, but also mapping multiple hazards in the most important and susceptible municipalities in the country. Um, they have been organizing emergency response and they have also developed uh, university programs to build uh, more capacities and more uh, human resources that could respond to natural disasters. Uh, so uh, this has been a very clever work by many geoscientists that have been, a lot of them, studying abroad and collaborating internationally with many uh, geoscientists throughout the world and doing all of this with ethical values, with honesty and responsibility. And we have been hearing about that during this session. So, uh, you know, the most recent uh, difficult situation that we have experienced is that Nicaragua has experienced a change regime in the past decade, you know, 12, 13 years already. Uh, so we have had, uh, you know, a terrible change where the country has experienced, uh, you know, devastating the democrat, the nascent democratic system that we were just starting to build after so many years of difficulties. And there's no rule of law now in Nicaragua, and this has all led 
to horrible human right abuses and violence uh, coming from the government. So this has been uh, worse in the past two years. You know, in two, um, two years ago, in April 2018, we had uh, a national rebellion of people protesting against the situation that we have been living. And unfortunately, it was uh, met with police violence. So, uh, you know, in the end, you know, what you would see through the cities was uh, police attacking students and students and universities were the main background where uh, people were starting to protest. You know, this is very common elsewhere. Uh, so you would see uh, like what you see right now in the picture, you know, police shooting at students and in the end, uh, human rights uh, committees uh, in Nicaragua and also the Inter-American Committee on Human Rights uh, have documented more than 300 people dead a lot of people are illegally taken into prison. And what we saw also was the government organizing paramilitary groups that uh, these are gangs, you know, that are supporting the government and they would go around the cities and terrorize all the citizens. So uh, this created, of course, a very unstable country and the economy went down, in particular, uh, the tourism, and it has seriously affected uh, science and education. Of course, you know, on the first hand, because most of the uh, young people that were protesting were university students, but this obviously had an impact on the economy and also on the university teaching and the government starting uh, creating, you know, repression also against professors that would be coming out defending the students. So in the end, you know, what we have a very, uh, it's a very unstable country where we experience this government repression and human rights. Now, this has been affecting most, uh, many professionals uh, in the areas of geosciences. And, you know, this is a very, uh, it's a shame because uh, geosciences were one of the strongest areas in the country, including the geosciences at the government level. So what we saw, you know, was uh, this has been uh, consequential, you know, on the difficulties for these professionals to do their work. And it has undermined the credibility of those institutions, you know, because uh, the government is dominating uh, the, the professionals, they cannot speak out, and they have been even forced you know, to do uh, things that the government asked them to do in terms of political issues. So this has had all had a uh, horrible uh, impact, you know, on the quality of the scientific research that uh, geoscientists are doing. Uh, I just wanted to briefly go through uh, a series of testimonies that I am bringing here to this forum. Uh, some scientists have shared what has happened with them. Obviously, I have to avoid mentioning the names, but you know, these are professionals that work at uh, ministries in government and they have been illegally fired. Uh, one of them says, uh, my participation has been interrupted by a political crisis and the destruction of institutions. They have been imposed to become members of the political parties, you know, otherwise they don't get jobs in the government. Uh, other people also working at public universities have been illegally fired uh, because they don't, uh, you know, sympathize with the political party. And by doing all of this, uh, the government has been destroying the scientific process that is normally taking place at geophysical uh, faculties. You know, a lot of the geoscientists, uh, scientists have also been fired. And that uh, this is in spite of universities having autonomy. So the government is not respecting the autonomy and is imposing the people that are uh, in favor of them and not the people that think differently. So this has uh, contaminated the way that science should be done in the country. Uh, usually there's no funds for research anymore and the funds are being directed towards political activities and imposing on those scientists to participate in those political activities. Uh, 
uh, as I was saying, you know, they uh, have been fired from different universities. This is the case of a professor that had been working at the public university for six years and was part of the teaching staff. And, you know, they are fired and the letters uh, where they are noticed that they're fired are shared with other people in political uh, leaderships. And the worst, I think, is what happened here, but they're very important scientists, geoscientists in Nicaragua, is the fact that the government has been using young scientists as forces uh, in the paramilitary forces to go around, harass people uh, at the universities and in neighborhoods. So this is a very horrible situation. And uh, what I wanted to address here is the work that the Academy of Sciences in Nicaragua has been doing, but this is obviously also the work that scientists as individuals have been doing as well. You know, and they have been really outspoken uh, denouncing this situation, denouncing this systematic destruction, including the human right abuses. So uh, we are concerned about the censorship, the harassment, the coercion and the prosecution on scientists. Uh, two specific examples is what I uh, wanted to explain here to you is uh, what happened with one large project that the government was promoting. It's called the Interoceanic Canal Project. You may have heard about that because uh, we have been writing a number of uh, scientific publications and uh, this has been considered as the largest engineering project in the world. Um, so, you know, what happened with this project was, again, you know, the government has not been respecting the voice of sciences, and they wanted to push this project through, you know, being careless. It went through parliament basically without any discussion, and it did not call scientists, you know, for conversations. Being uh, very, uh, you know, invasive, uh, it was considered the largest engineering project in the world. Of course, it involves a lot of uh, earth removals, and you would expect that, you know, that many geoscientists would be considering the planning and consideration of this project. And, of course, also the environmental impact that it would have, because it would go through a very sensitive environment in Nicaragua, you have the map there on screen, and the canal would go, you know, going through the Caribbean all the way, finding the Pacific, and going through uh, various natural reserves, including Lake Nicaragua, you know, which is the main water reservoir in Central America. So all these would require uh, specific considerations, scientific considerations, which were not taken care. And when we protested, you know, and demanded that there should be an environmental impact assessment, you know, finally the government uh, agreed and they said, well, the company is going to do, you know, the, the environmental impact, impact assessment. So the academy called for uh, running a couple of international workshops to discuss uh, the gaps in this, uh, uh, in this project. You know, and many scientists from all over the world participated in uh, providing insights regarding these projects. And eventually, uh, the scientists, you know, found that uh, the environmental impact assessment was not properly done. And they would have to be pointing out that uh, it has not provided the formal hazard or risk study for the project, although the areas of concern included at least 22 tectonic faults along the canal route. The other issue was that there was no analysis provided on the methodologies for the risk management associated with the fault movement and other associated, associated consequences. So the proposed canal uh, would cross uh, through high risk uh, volcanic activity and yet uh, crossing also the lake where there are twin volcanoes in the island of Pometepe, and yet the Asia was not including uh, an analysis, an appropriate analysis of volcanic impact. So this would have been a disaster. You know, fortunately, the project 
has not gone through uh, due to the fact that there's no money to run the project. But the other issue is that through all these uh, couple of years that I've been telling you that we had this uh, crisis, uh, the academy and scientists had very, have been very outspoken in calling the government to stop human rights abuses and also to let scientists do the work. Uh, so uh, human rights crisis has developed and it has affected uh, the economy. It also has affected the work, the way scientists work. So in regard to COVID, and I'll just make one line about this, it's the same thing happening. What we see is that the government is not considering science. So Nicaragua is denying that there is a pandemic, uh, you know, is, uh, is not acknowledging the appropriate numbers that uh, would tell us about the magnitude of the crisis. And it's also not implementing a plan, an appropriate plan, you know, to deal with the, um, with the crisis. So, I just wanted to summarize that uh, this experience of the Academy of Sciences and the scientists in general, uh, you know, being advocate for appropriate science, for not interference of politicians in the sciences, I think is probably of very good use to other scientists throughout the world. Uh, you know, we are demanding to stop human rights abuses and also we're demanding that uh, the government should let scientists do their work appropriately. Uh, and we also need to call, you know, for an international response. You know, we need the international global scientific community to support uh, Nicaraguans in the geosciences. Many of them have gone abroad. We already have a hundred thousand people abroad as a result of this crisis. You know, they have been taking refugee in neighboring countries, uh, in particular in Costa Rica. And uh, we need to deal with this crisis as scientists throughout the world as well. So we would expect uh, the global scientific community, you know, to have a saying about what Nicaraguan scientists have been experiencing. And of course, you know, because we know that this crisis uh, is gonna pass, uh, we're going to be left with very weak scientific institutions and we would need uh, the help from the international global community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorge. Very, very interesting indeed. I now would like to call on the floor again uh, Robin Bell to introduce the last speaker before the discussion, Jonathan Bamber. Okay, so now it's my turn to introduce Jonathan. Um, Damber, who many of us know as a professor of glaciology and who was recently the president of AGU and for 10 years was editor of one of the early open access journals, a long standing advocate for open access science and the public understanding. He served on many panels, both in the North America and in Europe, and he is passionate about scientific integrity and has seen it both in its good forms and its bad forms. So over to you, Jonathan. Um, so I'm, I'm the last of five speakers. I realize we're running a bit, sh bit late and so I'll try and keep this short and sweet. Um, and um, because I'm coming last, I, I didn't want to basically repeat what everybody else said. So I did look at all your abstracts and try and come up with something complimentary and slightly different. Uh, I guess the audience will have to decide whether I, I was successful with that. Um, I think my perspective is going to be perhaps a little bit different from, from the rest of the speakers in the sense that I'm going to uh, talk about what I understand, the, the important aspects of scientific integrity from the perspective of a scientific society or association, a little bit um, like so, some of the points or the perspective that Chris had, but really as a scientist and in some slightly different roles. Um, and there were sort of three key points that I wanted to make, um, which is the importance of individual versus collective responsibility. And I'll say a little bit about that. Um, the role of scientific societies in promoting integrity and engendering and supporting it in good practice. And then if I have time, um, a, a couple of points, uh, observations about what I think we can learn from the current pandemic and, um, 
uh, things that we can take forward from that. So I'll start with um, the importance of individual responsibility. Um, and, you know, each of us as scientists has a responsibility to the communities, the scientific communities we represent, uh, but also to those that actually pay for the science that we do. Um, and by and large, that tends to be um, taxpayers. And so I think I have one slide that I want to show. Um, this is, this is um, one slide, it's not mine. I stole it from um, someone called Sir David King, uh, with his permission, I should point out. Um, Sir David King was the chief scientific advisor for the UK government from 2000 to 2008. Um, and that was at a time actually um, in the UK when we had an outbreak of foot and mouth disease, which at a national level was a kind of akin in many respects to the current pandemic that we have. It's a very contagious disease that, that affects uh, livestock and um, tens of millions of livestock had to be destroyed. And there was a, 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 a lockdown in terms of movement of people and livestock at that time. Um, so, so he was um, advising the UK government during that and for um, a period of about uh, eight years. After that, he became the special envoy um, of the UK government to the UNFCC, that's the United Nations Framework on uh, Climate Change, until about 2017. And he developed, um, in collaboration with a number of uh, scientific associations, not just in the UK, but worldwide, um, this, what he's described as a universal ethical code for scientists. You, you, could, um, you could describe it as um, kind of Hippocratic oath for scientists, but that's a tiny bit controversial um, because um, some might argue that um, a, a Hippocratic oath and freedom of speech are in conflict. I think that's a false dichotomy and I don't want to get into the sort of philosophical issues around freedom of speech and freedom of scientific endeavour and um, integrity and ethics because that, that really is a false dichotomy. But so this is, this is his uh, Universal Ethical Code for Scientists, and I really like it. In fact, we, it was presented at a um, union session, I think Chloe will remember this, um, in 2017, which had a title of something like Make, Make Facts Great Again. And it was all around um, trust and regaining trust of the public in science and scientific process. And I'll just quickly run through the, what are called the three R's. So in, in the UK, in English schools, the three R's are normally mean um, writing, reading, and arithmetic, arithmetic. But um, here it's rigor, respect, and responsibility. So the rigor is act with skill and care in all scientific work, maintain upstate skills and assist others in the development of those skills. Take steps to prevent corrupt practices and professional misconduct. Declare conflicts of interest, that's rigor. Respect, be alert to the ways in which research derives from and affects the work of other people and respect the rights and reputations of others. Ensure that your work is lawful and justified. Minimize and justify any adverse effect your work may have on people, animals, and the natural environment. And your responsibility, seek, discuss the issues that science raises for society, listen to the aspirations and concerns of others. And that doesn't just mean the, the rest of the scientific community, that means wider society that's actually interested in what you're doing and um, the issues that you're investigating. Do not knowingly mislead or allow others to be misled about scientific matters. Present and review scientific evidence, theory or interpretation, honestly and accurately. Now look, I would hope uh, that in framework, certainly of this um, union session, we can all agree that those are, um, uh, that, that that's a code that we can all um, sign up to. Um, and um, I'm going to do something uh, a little bit bold, perhaps quite brash, actually. Um, and I, I sincerely hope that Sir David isn't watching this uh, because he won't like it. I'm going to add one more, um, one more uh, sort of code that I think is essential, particularly now, um, and that's transparency. And I, I, I'll explain why I think transparency is important. Integrity and trust are intimately connected. And without both of those, uh, we are not going to succeed in communicating our message to a wider audience. We're not going to succeed in convincing the public, policymakers, and the rest of the world that what we're saying um, is honest, uh, reputable, and matters. And so integrity and trust are vital to what we do. And part of developing that trust with our audience is being transparent about what we do. And I think that's where the open science um, is is 
an essential part of that activity. I, I have been a, a sort of, I wouldn't say lifelong, um, so I haven't been a scientist my whole life, but you know, since, since I've been aware of it, I've been a, a strong advocate of open science. I think it's, it's absolutely, the point about transparency is that um, we should welcome it unless we have something to hide. Why wouldn't you want to be transparent in what you do, how you operate, and in, in, in the, 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 the processes that you use to derive a result and, and um, you know, the actual, the, the methods. Um, you'd only be concerned about transparency if actually there was something you didn't want your peers or the rest of the world to know about. I can stop uh, sharing that slide and I'm happy to make that available. Um, actually, there is a, a Wikipedia page on, um, I think, Hippocratic Oath uh, for scientists and it started with Karl Popper and, and uh, Sir David King is just the kind of last person to contribute to that. But I think that there's some really important principles there. So that's a little bit about um, individual responsibility. Um, collective responsibility is a little bit harder, I think, because, um, because we, are, we are, as scientists, we are not a collective. Um, and um, there is no universal governing body like a, you know, like a government, like um, you know, the, the, a, a law that governs how uh, scientists, geoscientists actually operate. The closest to that, I would argue, um, are scientific societies. And so, I think it's absolutely vital that organisations like EGU, AGU, JPGU, and all the others that are involved in this session and elsewhere um, lead by example. You know, we as organisations must adhere to the highest ethical standards and operate with integrity in everything we do. And I think it's also vital that we make sure that we get that message, that we make sure that not just our members understand that and, and that we, we not just aspire but we hold these um, high ideals but we need to make sure that the wider community policymakers funders and the public um, are also very much aware of the way we operate and the way we do science um, and i think um i mean certainly speaking as former president of EGU, I, I i think it's fair to say that we we could and should do more to advertise explain and advocate to the non-science community um, about the scientific process how it works um, and the responsibilities we accept and uphold as scientists and the rigorous nature of the scientific process. I think it's fair to say that if you asked a member of the public, you know, uh, how does a paper get published? What's the process? The vast majority would have no idea. And I think the more we, we engage them, the more we make sure they understand um, um, how things work and we make sure it's transparent and open, um, the, the easier it is for us to gain their trust. And um, I think it's important that scientific societies um, are accessible and need to be representative. I can see that I'm slightly running out of time here. Um, and what, what do I mean by representative? Um, uh, there, I'm really referring to um, diversity. I think a lack of diversity in our scientific community doesn't help our connection with the public and it doesn't help our ability to gain the trust of the wider audience. You know, they have to connect with us. And, um, uh, you know, I think lack of diversity really doesn't help. And I am saying that as a middle-aged white male. So I do understand, you know, the privileged position that I, I'm in. Um, but I think um, we should and could do much more to improve the diversity of um, the scientific community. What, what can we learn from the pandemic? Um, well. You know, it's really interesting. In, in the UK, we have a daily briefing from uh, the Prime Minister when, when he's not in hospital um, and Minister of State for Health um, when he is. Um, and millions of the UK public watch this every day. And he is flanked on his left by the um, chief scientific advisor to the UK government and on his right by the chief medical officer. Two scientists. And in my lifetime, and in my lifetime as not just a scientist, my, my, my lifetime, that's the first time that you have had the public uh, looking at and listening to two scientists, two experts, and, and uh, actually wanting their advice and taking their advice on a daily basis. And I think that we do have um, a, 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 a real opportunity right now um, while the public are, and I, I think others have touched on this, while the public are receptive to um, science, scientific evidence, evidence-based process, and um, 
they are, um, you know, being an expert is not like seen as a derogatory term. It, we're not seen as elitist. I think we, we have an opportunity to engage much more with um, both government and the wider um, public. But uh, the counter of that is that I think it's also really important that we, in inverted commas, stay in our lane. What I mean by that is we, we don't get blown off course. We don't, we don't try to help out. We don't try to explain things or be useful um, in, in areas that are outside our own expertise because credibility is everything. Um, you know, where does credibility come from? You know, it takes a, a lifetime to acquire a reputation and it takes minutes to lose it. Um, I was in discussion with the BBC about a, um, a documentary series they were making and um, the researcher on, on the series said to me, you know, look, it's absolutely critical that we get every fact right. We can have a hundred facts in this program and if one is incorrect, it'll blow the whole series. Everything will be gone, our, our entire credibility. And I think we need to remember that as geoscientists, and, and I have seen this happen on, on Twitter and other uh, other sort of parts of social media and elsewhere, that, that it is very tempting for us to try and, I don't know, um, add, add our voice, try to be helpful, um, but in ways that actually aren't helpful are really counterproductive. So I think that that's a really important message. The final point I want to make, which um, is something that I feel really passionate and strongly about is that, uh, and, and I've written here, you know, in, in times of emergency or crisis, I, I genuinely believe that cooperation is better than competition. And actually I would argue that it's better at any time. Open science is better for society and it's better for the scientist. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you very much. Very inspired conclusion, and uh, I, I had 45 seconds left. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. I, I would like to thank all the speakers because we are basically on time. We, we got um, a list of questions, and uh, I think uh, I will need to make a selection. Some of them we got in the in the chat, and some of them in the question and answer box. I, I try to make a selection because I think. Uh, uh, they are indeed interesting, and uh, I would start with um, with a um, question for uh, Dr. Uh, Wete. And the first, uh, there is uh, a remark uh, by um, a member of the audience, and also let me point out that we had an audience ranging from uh, 300 to 350, so it's it's indeed excellent. So, as I said, first a remark: uh, um, a member of the audience brought very nice presentation to make people aware of the uh, current situation of science in Nicaragua is a big step already. And then there is a question for you, Jorge. And the question is, considering uh, all the sad problems uh, occurring in Nicaragua and the great potential for international and multidisciplinary projects uh, and high impact publication, how do you see the future of geoscience in this country? Will it get better? Any recommendations for local and foreign geoscientists? What could be possible solutions? So, Jorge. Thank you for the question and the remarks. Uh, it's very hard to answer because, you know, the solution to all these problems is solving the crisis that we have in Nicaragua, the, the social political crisis. And right now, we are at a very difficult situation where the government has established itself by force. So, you know, they have uh, their police and their supporters, uh, paramilitary all over uh, the city, controlling the city and, and the main cities and the whole country. Uh, and while we don't resolve that issue, you know, we're not going to resolve the issues of the impact on the geosciences and education in general. But of course, uh, you know, we, we do need to bring that to the international forum. And I was uh, pleading, you know, for a call, uh, calling for the global scientific community to support uh, geoscientists in particular, and other scientists, of course, you know, this situation has become ridiculous. And just give me one example that is gonna be very funny to you. Just uh, a few years ago, maybe three, four years ago, there was a huge explosion next to the airport. And uh, so, you know, the, the 
comments were that there was probably some military uh, uh, dealings and that there was some kind of accident. You know, so the government tried to cover that up, and for that they used geoscientists. You know, and what they made them say was that there was a meteorite that fell into Nicaragua, and because of that we had that huge explosion. So of course, you know, there's no proof of that. And then, you know, it's very uh, sad that, that they have to make geoscientists, you know, make ridiculous statements like that. So the situation is very bad. Uh, you know, people keep being fired, you know, because they are trying to replace uh, all the geoscientists that uh, do not necessarily submit to the government and they're putting their uh, people that are just complacent with the situation. Uh, but I, I think there is, you know, we should see the light at the end of the tunnel because this situation is very unsustainable, you know, and there's a growing demand from the population for a change. You know, of course, this has to be a very peaceful situation. You know, we don't want to go back to war. Nicaragua has a history of violence, you know, 10 years of war, uh, and I don't think anybody wants to go back to that. But the hope is that uh, with the help of the international community paying attention to Nicaragua and also paying attention to the way that uh, international scientific projects are developed could help you know, to bring some sense into this uh, horrible situation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's a challenging question. And I, I have a, a second question for Chris uh, McEntee. And uh, it is based uh, on the, an interesting uh, graph that you, you showed about the public trust in science. Um, and the question makes reference to the difference that we could see between United States, for instance, and uh, South America. The question is, how can we, as researchers, increase uh, uh, the trust of population in science uh, in countries where leaders had the other way, undervaluing scientific knowledge, uh, and uh, the, the person makes the example of Brazil? Well, it's a very difficult question, of course. Um, I, my own view is that perhaps the way to start is locally with your own communities and citizens and raise it from the grassroots up. Um, and I think that if we, it's not as serious in the United States, of course, with the top level government denying science, but it's not great in the United States. And what we see is that at the local level or even at the major urban areas, the, um, the governments are not, a, they're not following really the, the non-scientific advice, whether it's climate change or hazards or disasters or whatever. So my suggestion would be start locally and try to spread it through the grassroots as best you can. And to also not be afraid to speak out and correct the record. I think COVID is very interesting because there's a lot of scientific uncertainty in COVID-19. But what we see in the daily briefings is words from the top scientists saying, there's a lot we don't know. However, we do think if you do X, Y, and Z, that's the best way we can protect you right now. Um, and so, you know, we hear a lot about um, on the climate change side, um, kind of the, the focus on the uncertainty part. And I think it's important for scientists to speak about uncertainty, but also to say, but based on the best information we have today, this is what we think needs to be done. Um, and so that would be my suggestion. It's not a satisfying one because I'd like to see it differently in Brazil and elsewhere. Oh, I, I think your, your reply was satisfying indeed. And uh, it's, um, of course, it's another challenging question. So of course, uh, uh, we are not getting to the final solution, but I, I mean, the discussion is interesting. Uh, now I have a um, question for Claudia. And, uh, you know, uh, we, several of you speakers today spoke about uh, scientists getting or not into politics. And uh, you, Claudia, advocated that uh, uh, scientists should stick on their own business and be careful in getting into politics. But the, the person uh, remarks that it's not easy to set the boundary. So, uh, because, you know, 
politics is many things uh, and when you uh, when you present an opinion to the public an opinion or let's say a research results in a way you are already getting into politics so can you clarify what what is your your view on this so what does it mean that scientists should not get into politics well I'm not sure that was really the message I wanted to pass, that scientists should not get into politics. Uh, and I apologize if that uh, came across my, my presentation. Uh, actually, I think we as individuals, uh, we have opinions and you don't need always to represent the, the, the community that you are working with. As It doesn't matter if you are a scientist or if you are the person that collects the garbage. You must have an opinion on controversial uh, uh, issues and you should stand up and demonstrate them when necessary, what is your opinion and when you think and you believe strongly that they are wrong. So I, I don't really think that scientists should be uh, a kind of a special species that stays in a bubble and is super careful at expressing their own opinions. Of course, when it's about scientific facts, you should be uh, loyal to, to, the, to the facts, to the data that you have, and you be, should be transparent and, and uh, work in full integrity. But besides that, you also individuals, you vote, you, you must have an opinion about, about all the things, the crazy things that are going on, and you should express them. And I think that this idea that, I, I actually think it's very dangerous to think that scientists should, are, are some kind of a higher human beings at a, at a different level, and they should not get involved, they should get involved so that we don't end up in situations like we have now and uh, like uh, George just presented. I think it, we should act before we reach to that point. And if you see now, and if you look at history, in fact, the, democracy is not the naturals of history. Huh? It's actually the opposite. It's the, it's the exception to the rule. I'm not sure I replied to your question or yes, if I yes, <laughs> excellently, excellently, and um, I, I think you were very clear. And uh, uh, now I have a um, couple of uh, questions that I can condense uh, into one uh, uh, for Jonathan, I think. And uh, the first is uh, was posted in in the chat. So you, Jonathan, I think you saw it already. And uh, it says cooperation better than competition, but also public discussion between different scientists, possibly with the opposing opinions will improve the public trust in science. But on the other end, we got uh, another question, which is uh, um, how can we succeed in uh, getting uh, a sustainable future when there are uh, also within the scientific community, diversity of opinions which are very relevant and sometimes controversial. So, Jonathan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's um. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know what? Uh, I think I I I don't know. I would like to steer that question back to the point I made about transparency and um, honesty. I think. It's apps and, and this and it goes back to trust. I think it's absolutely essential that if we don't know or if we're unsure, we say we don't know and we say we're unsure because if we do anything else, we we destroy that relationship we have with whoever we're communicating with. And I think the more honest we are with the public and we don't treat them like uh, I'm not saying we do, but like idiots, like they don't know, or if we try and hide behind some kind of false sense of intellectual superiority or something or hide behind some kind of scientific mumbo jumbo and you know oh we're the experts you there's no way you would know about this then i think you know that's that that is what's going to be damaging but i really do feel that we need to um um uh, be honest when when we don't know the answers i i, I yeah I, I leave it at that okay thank you thank you very much now it's um I would like to ask the panelists uh, a question which is uh, uh, which doesn't have a um, predefined recipient, but I think I would like to address it to Sylvia. And the, the question is related to uh, the policy 
in, during the current crisis of founding agencies, uh, which are cancelling grants uh, and cutting funds uh, for disciplines that do not seem as uh, a priority uh, to, uh, with respect to the COVID-19 outbreak. And uh, the question says that this will uh, definitely have a negative effect on geosciences. And uh, so what are your thoughts about this problem? How can we deliver an efficient message to, to avoid this type of problem? Again, I, I would like to address this question to you, Silvia, given this subject of your, of your speech. Thank you for the question. It's not easy to, to reply because uh, funds are always uh, little. And so I understand if in a moment of crisis, uh, crisis um, it is normal that we have to use uh, uh, money in the best uh, way. The problem that is is a general. In my opinion, geoscience is not um, is not has not um, credit uh, in society. I don't know in other countries, but in Italy, geologists are not considered the, um, uh, so so prominent scientists, uh, and this is um, the result of a lot of reasons, in my opinion, and in part depends also on uh, our um, faults. Um, I think that authoritative of, ge of geoscience um, must, uh, must be promoted by ourselves uh, firstly. And um, we have to, to find, as I, I said, we have to find the, uh, the, the more eff effective way to, um, to put society in the condition to understand how much geoscience is important, especially in the, in the, um, in, in the future crisis that um, more or less we have we had to we will have to to address so uh, it, my opinion is that it is important to disseminate geoscience in society to find the space in the in the communication of science and also uh, to start from schools uh, to 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 disseminate geoscience knowledge because uh, um, knowledge implies awareness and awareness implies responsibilities and this is valid at all level in society for politicians for uh, citizens for media um, but uh, we or to disseminate we hope to to valorize to give value to our knowledge to make aware society that our contribution is, is is important because we are experts of the earth and the earth in this moment is uh, um, needs uh, some protection some uh, some uh, strategies to 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 allow our survival on this planet. So um, I think that there is a lot of things to do at different level as individuals, geoscience as individual, as uh, co co organizations. Um, it's complicated, but <laughs> I, I'm confident that we, we try. Now we are already uh, five minutes late, but I would like to ask one final very quick question. Uh, for uh, a quick answer and uh, could be asked to every one of you. So I just uh, toss my coin and uh, um, I, I would like to ask it to Claudia. So the question is, uh, uh, two best words are essential, integrity and freedom. Do we have it globally? So what is your perception, Claudia? And are we at risk? Uh, at the global level to lose integrity and freedom? Ah, that's, uh, I, I look into my magic uh, in my crystal ball and I will tell you what, what I think. Uh, I like to think that in Europe, 
no, we are not uh, at the edge of the cliff, but we have to remain vigilant. Um, you know that uh, this crisis, in my opinion, and surprisingly, has probably made the union stronger. Despite some hiccups at the beginning, I, I really believe and the, and the, the signals have been positive uh, that in the next uh, multi-annual uh, financial framework, that there will be more efforts put um, so economically uh, for increasing the budget for science, not just for the pandemic or pandemic relate, directly related issues, but generally for science. So I'm, I'm, I'm positive about that. And uh, I think we need a strong union because without that, uh, everything falls apart and we just go back 60 years in history and we will be in the same uh, spot where we were. Um, so no, I, I, I'm positive, but as I said, we need to remain vigilant and, and, and really act when we know the things are going in the wrong direction. Thank you, Claudia. I'm um, really excited by this event. Uh, and um, I would like to close with a final remark by myself. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the statements, uh, one of the lessons that we learned today is uh, that we basically we reinforced today because we knew it already is that under a crisis, cooperation is better than competition. So within this perspective, I would like to, to announce that just uh, a couple of hours ago, uh, EGU and uh, uh, other five sister associations, including uh, AGU, JPGU, GSA, uh, GSL, and the AOGS, uh, signed a proclamation. And the proclamation is uh, now published on the EGU website. It's a pro proclamation in favor of international cooperation in uh, scientific research. It's a commitment to work together to support and promote all forms of geoscience research. So I think it uh, fits nicely in the context of uh, the event and discussion that we had today. I thank uh, once again uh, the co-conveners, uh, the speakers uh, and uh, the audience. And also I would like to thank Chloe and the EGU staff for putting this event together.